Hello world, Noah here with some exciting news. After many, many, many months of work and multiple delays, uh, Java version 9 has finally been released just the other day. Uh, Java 9 is the latest version of Java uh, at this point, and uh, it adds some new language features over Java 8. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to install the Java Development Kit version 9, how to set it up in your IDE, and then we'll talk about some of the things that are new and do a little bit of a demonstration of that. Um, so of course, the first thing that you need to do uh, when the new version of Java comes out is to download it. And uh, Java provides two different downloads uh, for you. So uh, we'll just go ahead, and the easiest way to find it, to be honest, is just to search um, for uh, Java download. And you want to go to, uh, I believe right here, yep, we want to go to oracle.com, uh, and you'll see right here it says Java SE 9. Um, so that is the latest version of Java, brand new version, and that's what we want to try to install. If you're looking for Java 8, it's right below it, or in earlier versions below that too. But of course we want Java 9. Now you'll notice that there are three different options, JDK, Server JRE, and JRE. So JRE stands for Java Runtime Environment, and that's basically everything that you need to run a Java program. So if you're just an end user trying to run a program that's written in Java, the JRE is all you need. And you know you pick JRE if you're on a computer and server JRE if you're running it on a server. But we want the JDK, which is Java Development Kit. And that contains, in addition to be able to uh, run Java programs, it contains tools for compiling and packaging uh, Java code and, and working with Java programming in Java and all of that. So that's, of course, uh, what we want to use here. So we want to go ahead and download the JDK. And you'll notice that there are a uh, bunch of different versions uh, for whatever operating system you need. So I'm going to grab the Mac OS version for my Mac, uh, but if you are on Windows or Linux, then, uh, then you can grab your version. You'll notice that the download is actually uh, bigger than uh, it used to be. It used to be maybe 150 to 200 megs or something like that. Actually, we can go check. Uh, so for Java 8, um, yeah, it was 226, and now it's nearly 400 megabytes. And I believe the reason for this is because of one of the new features in Java 9 called uh, Jigsaw, which I'll just mention briefly. Um, but essentially, there's some more files that need to be packaged um, into the Java development kit, but this enables the Java runtime environment to, uh, to actually be smaller. Uh, so that's downloaded. That was pretty quick. So we'll go ahead and open this up and we're going to install it. And this is super simple. Um, you just run through like that, and we'll give it a second to install. And OK. So uh, at this point, Java 9 uh, has now been installed, the Java 9 development kit. Um, so I'm going to be using IntelliJ, uh, JetBrains IDE for Java, instead of Eclipse in this video. I'm not quite sure what Eclipse's support is for Java 9. Uh, I'm sure you could just use Java 9 and Eclipse, but it may not support all of the latest language features. Um, but I know that IntelliJ has supported Java 9 for a while when it was uh, back in development. Um, so that's what I'm going to go with today. And in case you aren't aware, um, JetBrains makes all of these great IDEs, and you can get all of them for free just for being a student. Um, so that's something that's super nice. Uh, before we go ahead and create a new project, I'm going to go to Configure uh, and then Preferences. And then I'm going to go to Build, Execution, and Deployment, I believe now. Where is it? No, it's actually in the project itself. Never mind. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project. And actually, there, it, it already uh, found it. So it says Java version 9. Um, it should detect it automatically. Um, but if for whatever reason it doesn't, um, you just have to point it uh, to where it's supposed to go. So for, for the Mac, it's library Java, Java Virtual Machine, Java 9. You can see I have Java 8 installed as well, but Java 9, contents, home, so right there. And you can see it says Java 9, um, which is exactly what we want. And I just want to do an empty project, nothing special in there. 
Um, and I'm going to call this uh, Java 9, just so we can test it. OK, um, so let's open up the project. And the first thing that we'll go ahead and do is a super quick um, Hello World program, just to confirm that Java is installed um, correctly. And then we can actually look at some of the new features. Um, I'm also going to let it index, because I did just install a new version of Java, so it needs to go through that a little bit and just uh, recognize everything. OK, so we're going to just system.out.println hello world. And then we're going to right click and hit run. And OK, it says hello world. And you can clearly see it's running JDK-9. Um, so we can tell that it's actually working correctly. All right, so let's take a look at some of the uh, things that are new. Uh, now, this isn't like Java 8, where there were those major, major changes like lambdas and streams and all of that. This is uh, a lot more behind the scenes stuff. Uh, but there are a couple of, of changes that, that you would notice and that hopefully you would enjoy. Um, so the first thing that we'll talk about is uh, the improvements to the processes API. Uh, so basically, Java has allowed uh, for spawning external processes for a long time. Um, so like if you need to use a system level process, um, you can run it through Java, and it would essentially be the equivalent of like opening terminal or command prompt and running the command. Uh, but now in Java 9, you have a lot more control over uh, the process itself. Um, so essentially, basically, you just want to spawn a process first. And the easiest way to do that is to do runtime.getRuntime.exec. And you'll notice there's a couple of different options. You can also use uh, Process Builder um, if you want. Uh, but we'll just do this. And so, for example, we could execute the command, um, you know, like, uh, like ls or, or whatever command we want to use. Um, and we will need to surround this in, in a try and catch uh, just because it has a chance of throwing an exception. Uh, but anyways, so we call exec, and it gives us um, an instance of process. And this is uh, the same thing that it's always done. It's always given an instance of process. But if you do p dot, you'll notice um, that there's a lot more uh, methods here. There's a lot more information. Um, so we basically, before we kind of had you know the error stream, the input stream, the output stream, a couple, uh, a couple of other things. Um, but there wasn't much uh, that we had access to. But now we have access to a lot more. Um, so some of the important things are like, so children um, will tell you, you know, what processes were spawned uh, from the, uh, what processes did your process spawn? So like if I, if this process spawned a bunch of children to do some different actions, then I could get access to that if I wanted to. Um, destroy and destroy forcibly goes without saying. Uh, pretty much, uh, this info method will give a uh, an instance of, of info, and info is just um, a an interface that contains it can tell you what arguments, what command, um, you know, when it started, what user it is, stuff like that. So you can get information about the process that's currently running. Um, you can also get the PID uh, of the process, so that can certainly uh, be useful sometimes. And the last interesting thing is this new on exit method. And this on exit method can be used um, to help you tell um, when the process uh, exits, when it finishes. Um, and so what you could do, you could do something like, so on exit gives you a, com uh, a completable future. And it is really confusing because there's a ton of methods in there. Um, but basically, we just want to use uh, then apply. And we'll give it a function. So for example, we could say process um, exit value. So I'm just doing a method reference to that. And basically what happens is when the process exits, then it will apply this method, which will basically just tell me the exit value. So I could write this as uh, future uh, integer, I believe. Exit value is an int, yeah. So future integer exit value 
equals uh, p dot on exit dot then apply whatever. So I don't actually know when it's going to uh, exit, but when it does, I'm going to get the exit value of the process, and it'll go into this um, this future. Um, and you know, I can check to see if it's done, and I can do get to to get myself um, the integer. Uh, so that's basically just a little look at, at processes. It's not something that's terribly common um, that you'd use a lot, but when you do need to use it, you now have a lot more control over the processes that you're running. Uh, and I know I've had to use it once or twice for certain things, and this is definitely a welcome addition. Uh, the next couple things are kind of small changes. Uh, first, I think it's worth mentioning, the implementation of the string class has changed slightly. So now, um, the data of the string is actually stored in a byte array instead of a character array. And this basically allows strings to be a little more memory efficient um, because before it was storing it in a character, which I believe was 16 bytes, and now it's, uh, sorry, 16 bits, so I guess two bytes. Um, and now it's just one byte. Um, so that's a lot better. And then it also has this coder, uh, which basically says, you know, which encoding are you using? Are you using Latin encoding or UTF-16 encoding, um, essentially? So that basically allows you to have the coder as a single byte, and then all of the bytes inside a value will be encoded, you know, in the same value that coder represents, and it allows for strings to be more memory efficient. So that's certainly, uh, certainly a welcome change. And the last thing that's worth mentioning is um, some of the uh, collection uh, classes. So um, list uh, or uh, yeah, list uh, map and set have been given some utility methods. So um, you can now do list dot of, and uh, you'll see that there are all of these methods here. Um, but you can you can basically pass uh, a list of values. So I can do list dot of you know one two three, um, whatever, and that will actually give me a uh, a list of type integer. So something like that. Um, yeah. So uh, it's pretty pretty uh, pretty simple, and you'll notice that it is immutable. Um, so it's not a list that you could like modify. But you can actually say new array list, oops, and then and then put that as a as a parameter like that. So basically, list.of will give you an immutable list with the items that you specified. And in some cases, that may be okay. And sometimes, if you want a mutable list, you can just put it in the constructor of a new array list. This also exists for set, so you can do set.of. Um, and then you can pass a bunch of elements. A set is like a list, but it's unordered, and there's no duplicates allowed in a set. Um, but there's that, and then also for map. So you can do map.of, and you essentially pass the first key and the first value, and then the second key and the second value, third key, third value, so on and so forth. So you just pass key value pairs like that. Um, you can also do of entries if you have like a list of entries. Um, you can use that. And once again, this is an immutable map, so you can just put it inside of a hash map constructor to make it be mutable. Um, so so uh, that's definitely a welcome addition because before um, this did exist, you could do like arrays.asList and you could essentially get the same thing. But especially for, for maps, you kind of had to like add all of the keys and values manually. There wasn't an easy way to deal with it. So this is certainly uh, a welcome addition. And of course, these are sort of made for shorter um, lists. If you're going to be putting hundreds or more uh, items in a list or a set or a map, you should probably be reading from a file or using some sort of a loop or something like that. But uh, but for a short list, like, you know, one, two, three, or, or whatever, that definitely works very well. And the last thing that uh, that I'm going to show you um, is probably, I think, the most interesting feature of Java 9. Um, maybe second most interesting to Project Jigsaw, but I think it's the most interesting. And um, it's this new feature called JShell. And this is Java's REPL. REPL stands for Read, Eval, Print Loop. Um, and a lot of other languages have this. So basically, uh, you know, you might have 
uh, had experience doing this in Python. So I open up Python and I get this uh, shell here and I can type in like x equals one. And then I can type x and it'll tell me it's one. Uh, you know, I can print out x again, and it'll tell me it's one. I can do y equals two x or two times x and print y and it's two. So basically what's happening here is I'm entering some sort of text. So like I'm saying z equals one. Then it's going to evaluate that text. Then it's going to print uh, whatever it's supposed to print. In this case, nothing. But if I said Z, it's going to tell me what Z is. And then it loops and it starts over again. So that's what an REPL is. It just reads one single line from the user. It evaluates that line, prints the result if there is something to print, and then it waits for the next one. And Java now has this feature, which is great because a lot of languages have had it for a while. And we can start it up by doing J shell. Um, and now we're, we're here, so, um, so we can try it out. So for example, uh, we can do int x equals 10, and you can see it tells me that, uh, that the variable x has the value of 10, and if I want to look at x, it's going to tell me um, that x has the value of 10. And if I want to print x, it's going to just print out the number 10. But you can see this is a different way of, uh, of interacting with Java because instead of writing a whole program and then running it, it actually runs line by line. Um, and of course, you know, I could say int y equals 12 and I could do uh, what's x plus y and it tells me that it's 22. But here's something interesting. It says dollar sign five is 22. And essentially uh, what happens is each time you evaluate something, the result gets stored in a dollar sign uh, variable. So this would be uh, 0, 1, 2, or I guess uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this is interesting because I can refer to these as if they were variables. So I can refer to dollar sign 5 as, uh, as 22. And I think, okay, so you can't actually refer to uh, variables like, uh, like this is, I called it y. Um, but it'll, it'll essentially allow you to have these anonymous variables. So if I type in 10, um, it's going to store the value 10 to the variable dollar sign seven. So it basically creates this new variable. And if I want to go and print out that result, I can print out dollar sign seven, and it's this variable that was created for me, and it has a value of 10, which is nice. So it allows you to do something. You know, you're trying to do uh, a little math things. So you're doing try to 10 times. Uh, the square root of 9, and uh, that's of course 30 because it's 10 times 3, and that stores it into a variable called dollar sign 9, and then you know I want to use dollar sign 9, I can print it out, I can add it, whatever I want to do. Um, so that's basically uh, the Java read eval print loop. Um, you can do a lot of different things with it, but it's great if you just want to quickly test one line and see if it works or you want to do a quick math calculation that involves some sort of function, um, whatever, whatever you want to do with it, it's a nice tool to have so you don't have to fire up your IDE, make a new project, make a new class, write all the boilerplate code with the main method and all that, and then finally write your code. Uh, so it's definitely a welcome addition to, uh, to Java. And the one main thing that I haven't talked about today is Project Jigsaw. And that's basically Java's attempt to um, break the runtime environment up into a bunch of different modules um, so that the runtime environment can be smaller and programs can just load and use the modules that they care about. So I think that really deserves its own video. Uh, and I'd also like to wait a little while until um, people begin to adopt Jigsaw into their projects, and then I can give a better example of it. Um, so I'm going to leave it just at this. If you're interested in a full list of what's new, um, it is available. You can just Google um, Java 9, and uh, right here, this first result, what's new in JDK 9, and it'll give you this whole list. There's a lot of um, behind the scenes stuff that's new. But these are just all of the most interesting things that you might actually notice or, or, or use. So that's about all for this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed. I hope this was interesting. Um,
and I hope that you enjoy using Java 9 now that it's finally out. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Bye for now.